Hello there. In this technical video, I'm going to talk about these flashes. And I know you may have a standalone separate one like this, or you may have one built into your camera, or you might not even call it a flash. You might call it a strobe or a speed light, but that's okay. They all work the same. I'm just going to give you a very simple technical overview of what they do, how they work, how they synchronize with the camera, and also clever things like slow sync and red eye reduction. This is not, I should point out, uh, an introduction to lighting video. This is just the absolute basics of how these things work. I've got an entire series of lighting videos that are on their way in the not too distant future, so keep your eyes peeled. But for now, let's get stuck into the basics of what flash is and what it does. Time to talk about flash. Now, it's a topic I don't want to go into in too much detail because it can get insanely complicated. And if we're only talking about the one that's built into your camera, there's really not much point going into enormous depths about various lighting ratios, soft boxes, umbrellas, radio triggers, all of that sort of malarkey. But I feel it's worth covering in some detail at least because you need to know what these little things do built into your camera. Now flash as a, as a thing is a very useful way, a very powerful, very portable way built into your camera of adding extra light to the scene. Now you might need to do this to lower the contrast. If you're outside on a bright sunny day, you might need to do this to create a certain lighting effect, or you might need to do it simply because the scene you're shooting in is very, very dark. Flashes are very portable and very powerful ways of putting light into a scene, far more portable and useful than carting around massive movie lights that you see on you know, film sets. This way you can add a blast of light very, very quickly and very, very easily, and it all fits within your camera's confines, or you know, fits into a package like this. The reason they're so powerful and portable is, in simple terms, they work by taking the power from the batteries, storing that in a big bank of capacitors, and then those capacitors discharge that power as light in very brief pulses or flashes. Uh, you might call flashes uh, speed lights. I won't hold that against you. Uh, me being very old fashioned, I call flashes flash guns because they flash. Uh, but don't worry, if you call them speed lights, the terms are interchangeable. Nothing to be ashamed of. Now the fact that the pulse of light from a flash is so brief means that it has to be synchronized with when your shutter is open. Otherwise, the moment when your shutter is open and exposing the sensor may not be the same time as the flash is firing. What that means in practice is, is actually, with DSLRs certainly, uh, a point at which you can't go any faster with your shutter speeds, otherwise you start to get this effect. Now this happens, this black band across the image, because if you think back to exposure and how shutters work, you have the camera shutter is closed like this, the first curtain opens to expose the sensor, then the second curtain closes behind it. Now that's what happens during a fairly slow shutter speed. If the shutter speed was one second, it would go open and close. Of course, as the shutter speed gets faster and faster and faster, what happens is, the first curtain starts its journey and the second curtain starts before the first is finished. So there's never a point when the sensor is fully exposed. You often have basically just a band of light passing in front of the sensor. And because of course the flash is only fine for a very brief period, you only get that portion of the sensor illuminated because the second curtain's already started its progress. So you have the shutter opening, and with a nice long shutter speed, it's exposed a decent amount of time. With a shorter shutter speed, it's going dunk dunk very, very quickly, and the flash can't cover enough of that. At speeds around your maximum synchronization speed, so the fastest speed you can get away with, the effect can be quite subtle. The more you push beyond your maximum shutter speed, the more and more marked that effect gets, because the gap between the two blinds gets smaller and smaller and smaller, depending on how fast the shutter speed is. That maximum synchronization speed varies from camera to camera, but it's often in the region of 1 250th of a second. What that means is you are absolutely fine to synchronize with the flash at speeds below that, but past that speed, faster than that speed, you will need to use special modes and special settings if they're available. Now the most common way to get around this maximum synchronization speed issue is to use what's called high-speed synchronization flash. Again, it sometimes goes by different names, depending on different camera manufacturers. What this does is it basically tells the flash, rather than firing a very, very brief pulse of light, to in fact fire a slow pulse of light and almost function like a, like a torch, like you would hold in your hand. What that means is that as this narrow gap 
between the shutter blades goes past, it's not a problem because the flash is illuminating the whole time. Great, you think. Now I can synchronise my flash with very fast shutter speeds and freeze lots of action. There is obviously a catch. If you imagine how much power is put into a flash that's very, very brief, that's giving you, say, full power manual, and therefore you've got the exposure right at full power manual with a normal flash. If instead you ask the flash to try and fire that same amount over a second duration rather than one five hundredth of a second or one thousandth of a second, which is what it normally flashes at, normally flashes very, very quickly, don't forget, you're going to lose power. So when you tend to move into high speed sync mode, in whichever form it might be on your camera, your flash will technically start to lose power, and it will lose power depending on how fast you synchronise. So if your maximum synchronisation speed is 1 250th, and then you go to 1 500th, and you switch your flash to high speed sync, your flash will have lost a bit of power. By the time you push to 1 4000th, 1 8000th of a second, your flash is now putting out very, very little power because it's having to take the same flash that was originally going in just a blink of an eye, and is now being pulsed out over a longer duration. Okay, so as always, there's a trade-off. Never works perfectly, does it? There's always some kind of trade-off. Now, if you're using uh, a mirrorless camera like this compact here, rather than a reflex camera like an SLR, so something without a mirror and a prism inside it, most of what I've just said about maximum synchronization speed doesn't matter because the shutter functions in a different way. Uh, you can basically synchronize with your flash at any speed you like. Um, well done you in that case. Uh, it is one of the big pluses to using mirrorless cameras, I have to say, although I still rely on these things, these do have advantages, you know. Now, depending on your camera and flash combination, you may have the option to shoot in what is called night mode or slow sync mode. Now, what this does is, if you're using any sort of automatic exposure mode on a camera, which obviously we don't, we use manual all the time, don't we boys and girls, it allows you, in very dark situations, to let some of the ambient light in when you're exposing. This is because normally, if you're in quite a dark situation, you're, you're inside at a, at a wedding or you're shooting outside at night and you've got flash, your camera will say, great, I've got flash, I've got enough power to light the person standing six feet in front of me, I will expose for that person, and I will give the camera a nice fast shutter speed to reduce any camera shake. You take a picture and of course, the person is correctly exposed for the flash and they're nice and sharp and there isn't any shake, but anything beyond that person is pretty dark. Now I'm sure we've all seen shots like this from weddings or shots we've taken outside at night or at gigs, because obviously, even a big flash like this, if I'm lighting somebody six feet away with it, they'll be correctly exposed, but there's no way this light can light them perfectly and light the entirety of, say, a ballroom. It's just not possible. So you end up with them being perfectly lit and the rest of the room or the rest of the area you're in being very, very dark. Now, night mode or slow sync mode, depending on what your camera calls it, tells your camera, OK, try and expose for the rest of the scene as well. And generally it does that by slowing down the shutter speed quite a lot. So one thing to watch for if you're using this is there's a decent chance that what's in the background might end up quite blurred. Your subject might still be quite sharp because of course the flash is so brief and the flash is lighting them that they'll actually be quite still a lot of the time. But this is a good time to get your tripod out. Uh, certainly for shooting outside at night with say street lights, you'll get your subject nice and sharp, but the background, if you're not on something solid, will get quite blurry. What it does, of course, as it slows the shutter speed down, is it lets more and more and more light in from the surrounding scene to make the, the shot look more natural. Now, of course, if you're shooting in manual mode, which we all are, aren't we, so we can understand how our cameras work better, these night mode, slow sync modes don't really matter because you're making choices yourself anyway. You will already have elected when you've got to a scene like this to go, ah, OK, my flash can expose correctly for the subject six feet away, but I'm going to slow the shutter speed down so that I can pick up the rest of this wedding venue or I can pick up the lights across the river. But it's worth knowing what some of these automatic modes do, I find, because occasionally they can be useful. Something else automatic your flash may come with is something called red eye reduction mode. Um, I can honestly say I've never used this intentionally in my life. Uh, I may have used it once or twice by accident because my settings have slipped, but I've never touched it. Uh, and I'll save you a lot of time by telling you don't bother using it. Now it exists for a simple reason that on-camera flashes tend to be located like this one is very close to the axis of the lens. 
So if you're aiming at something, the light goes out, the subject gets bounced straight back. If your subject is a person and you're shooting particularly in dark areas, which of course is where flash tends to be used, what you'll find is that flashlight reflects off pigmentation within their eyes and gives you that red eye look, okay, that, that demonic look. It's not a great look, I have to admit, but there's a reason I don't use red eye reduction mode very much. The red eye can be taken out in a couple of seconds in Photoshop or frankly even smartphones nowadays have got software that will remove it. What red eye reduction mode does with your flash is before you fire the actual flash, so you press the shutter to take the picture, it then fires a series of pulses or fires a bright light at your subject which then reduces the pupil and shrinks it down so that the reflection isn't as strong. So it reduces the effect of the red eye. That sounds very clever. In practice what it means is that you are mashing away at the shutter and it's not taking a picture because it's busily blasting flash at their eyes or it sets off several flashes and then the real flash. All of which means your subject's gone smile and then stop smiling or they've closed their eyes or they've moved or you've missed the moment. Basically it puts in a sort of two to three second delay between pressing the shutter and actually taking the picture. We don't want that, do we? So I would suggest never use it. If you do get red eye, just take it out in Photoshop or in other similar software. And when we come to learn about lighting in more depth, when you come back and join the lighting course, we'll show you that the answer really is just to take the flash off camera. Obviously you can't do that with this, you'd uh, break it, but you can take the flash off camera with ones like this. So that really is as much detail as I want to go into about flash. Uh, it's a bit of a rabbit hole to disappear now if we're not careful. Like I say, keep your eyes peeled. I've got a lighting course on the way, hopefully sooner rather than later, because flash is fantastic stuff, no doubt about it. I use it on almost every single shoot I'm on, but I pretty much never use the built-in ones. Worth knowing though what some of the automatic modes are, how it behaves, and also how you can stop it from doing the wrong sort of thing. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Uh, as I stressed in the video, I don't want to get into too much depth of flash because it is a huge topic and lighting in its own right is definitely a standalone thing. I just wanted to give you the absolute basics of how flash works. Just a couple of videos left now in the entire technical fundamentals course, so stay tuned next week for more information which we're going to be talking about equipment. Uh, meanwhile, you know what to do with YouTube. Hit like if you like things, subscribe, etc, etc, and I'll see you soon.